title, The Move of God. <clears throat> Principle, Scripture teaches in eternity, God will forever be in motion with His people, moving them to new stages of life. Turn to Revelation, the seventh chapter, verses 14 to 17. Revelation, the seventh chapter, verses 14 to 17. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest, and he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the light, sunlight on them, nor any heat. The Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. We find in eternity is going to be a move of God, a special move of God in a relationship to these people. <coughs> that relationship is going to lead them into new vistas of life in eternity. Turn to Revelation 14, verses 1 to 4. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, with him 140 and 4,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, with the voice of many waters, and was the voice of great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers hopping with their hearts. <clears throat> and they sung as it were a new song before the throne, before the poor beasts, and before, before the elders, and no man could burn that song of the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. So what they find here, it says, <clears throat> uh, picking it up in, continuing in verse 4, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. So he is leading them into new life experiences into eternity. They follow him wherever he goes. Revelation 21. Verses 3 to 5. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself shall be with them. Revelation 21, yeah. verses 3 to 5. Uh, and verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither there sh shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. <clears throat> and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. He said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. He was talking about new, eternal experiences with these that he's come down from heaven to minister to, because he will dwell with them. So what we're looking at here, in eternity, <coughs> the scripture is showing us God is going to deal with his people from a position of love and ministry and teaching. He's leading the different groups into new eternal experiences. Notice what it goes on to say here. It says, <clears throat> verse 5, He that set upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. <clears throat> it says the former things are passed away. So there are eternal life experiences, unique to each group. 
We want to focus on that principle. Each group has a unique relationship unto itself. And is expressed by its testimony. In other words, the testimony reflects the relationship that is being experienced with God. Turn to Revelation, the fifth chapter, verses 9 to 10. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So they're singing their relationship with him. It's a love song illustrating the unique union that they share with him. In this particular capacity, it's talking about being made kings and rulers, being redeemed from the earth. What we find here is the scripture is giving us the understanding that the relationship is a group-centered experience. Everybody in that group shares that particular unique relationship. No other group is going to be able to share that relationship except those with those that are singing the same harmonious song. Revelation 14th chapter, verse 3. <clears throat> and they sung, as it were, a new song. Why does it say new song? Well, it's a new song because it hasn't been sung before. They sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which are redeemed from the earth. So the song that they're singing reflects the relationship that they have, which is described in the previous verses. Mm -hmm. The song that they sing re <coughs> reflects the experiences that this group has had in the unique relationship. In other words, they all share this common experience which took them from earth to heaven, which they shared on earth. They were brethren. They all had the, the same ministry. They come out as a group. They go before the throne as a group. And they sing their testimony as a unique group. It says, no man could learn that song. In other words, nobody could sing that song but those because of the unique relationship they had. Nobody can sing somebody else's testimony. Nobody can share somebody else's <coughs> relationship. So everything we find is going to be a group setting. Revelation 15, verses 1 to 4. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass, mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. And it goes on to continue what they're saying. They sing their testimony. They sing their relationship. These have all died, overcoming the beast and his mark. Shared relationship, which <coughs> has prepared them for the unique relationship that they're going to share with God in eternity. Everything is a group setting. Turn over to Romans, the 8th chapter. Romans the 8th chapter, you want to pick it up in verse 17. Verse 17. And as children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together as a group. What that means 
<laughs> illustrating the principle. The scripture is teaching the relationship we have in eternity is dependent on the type of relationship we cultivate with God on earth. Now if we as a group continue and have these experiences on earth that God has ordained for us to have, then we will be part of a group in heaven because we have a shared series of situations, of experiences on earth. Everything you have in Christ was, was preordained of God because He's determined the group He wants us to be in to begin with. But that's not always the case. An individual can drop out of that group because of falling behind, lack of commitment, distraction, any number of things. But what's being said here <clears throat> is that God desires the relationship that He has waiting for us in heaven to be predicated on the commitment we have on earth. We're going to take a look at some scriptures that illustrate this. Philippians, second chapter, verses 12 to 13. Make it 12 to 14. Philippians, second chapter, verses 12 to 14. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, go forward in the experiences that God has foreordained for us to have. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of His good pleasure. God is working in us to perfect the relationship that He wants us to have by the experiences that we are having, which are only preparing us for the ultimate experience, relationship with Him in heaven. Do all things without murmurings and disputing. So what He's saying here, if we're in Christ, if we've been committed to Christ and we're on a path, that path is ordained by God. On that path are certain experiences that God ordained. Those experiences are to bring us into the type of relationship that God wants us to have with Him. This is God in you, so He's in us, working in us to perform His good pleasure saying basically everything that God does, everything that He's pleased in doing is good. As we yield to what's taking place without murmuring and complaining, but realizing that all things work together for good, eternal good, and we yield to what God wants to do in our lives, the relationship only gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Turn to Colossians, the first chapter, verse 25 to 27. Colossians, the first chapter, 25 to 27. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to the saints to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you the hope of glory now people read this and it just goes over their head what is being said here Christ in you the hope of glory I put it Christ in you the hope of a relationship with him in glory he's molding us in a relationship on earth, which is a precursor to the relationship we're going to have in heaven. Now, when you read Revelation, you see the relationships that they're having, which is indicated by the testimony, the songs that they're singing. Some have a closer relationship than others. Those that come out of the tribulation period have a more distant, although it's a close relationship, which they, they gain by dying, but there, further away, he has to come to dwell with them. Those that have the closest relationship are those that are seated around the throne. Ephesians, second chapter, 
verses 5 to 10. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace, his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now what this is saying, I'm going to stop here a minute and explain something, is what God foreordained for all that he called was this relationship where they'd be seated around the throne, raised to the highest degree of exaltation, having the closest relationship. But you're going to have the majority, the majority of the calls won't make it. The rapture takes place. A remnant, a minority will make it. So they will be the ones you see pictured around the throne, having the closest relationship. The others will make it good through the tribulation period and martyrdom. And then they come up before the throne, for the throne, never around the throne. Again, that opportunity is gone. Therefore, their relationship in eternity, although a beautiful, sweet, love relationship, will still be less than it would have been if they have Christ. Missing the rapture. Now, this is what he's talking about here. God desires for all that he's called to experience this intimate relationship with him. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The works are to glorify God. And in glorifying God, we mature, we have a closer relationship, and He gets the glory for us. As we yield to God's desire for us, He prepares us for the eternal relationship He predestinated us for in eternity. It talks about we go from glory to glory, we're perfected from glory to glory. Each experience that we have is designed to enable us to enter into a closer relationship with the Father. Each experience is designed to give us the understanding of the Father's purpose, to give us the opportunity to progress that much closer to the goal, ultimate union with Christ. Now in Ephesians, the first chapter, we want to read verses 4 to 12. According as He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. He chose us to have a love relationship with Him, to walk in a committed life in which He would be free to bring us through the experiences that He's designed for us to have, complete us. Having <coughs> predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. This is telling us <coughs> that he's molding us in the image of Christ because that's the only image that would enable us to have the preeminent position of being seated with him. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. That's how we got here, through the work of Jesus Christ. Wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he had purposed in himself in other words God will reveal to us all things why we are in the situation we're in how we can make the best of the situation get free it says he will reveal the mystery of his will to us and his purpose Verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, and repeat that, 
that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him so he will reveal to us as an individual that we are on a progression toward a gathering point that the ultimate goal is to prepare us to be gathered in a unity with others who are walking the same path having the same experiences that we might be in union together because we're going to be glorified together we're going to go through the adoption process together and we're going to constitute one unique group called the brethren that's the Father's purpose which he will reveal if we're open to receive it and when he reveals it to us and we understand that we don't have any time to fritter around that God is uniquely bringing us into the finality of his grandiose plan of the ages this thing is getting ready to wind down completion and only those that are ready when the XY axis crosses are going to have that experience he goes on <clears throat> we're going to work at the end of the council of his own will so he's talking about this is a sovereign decision on the part of God verse 12 that we should be through the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ now what does that mean to the praise of his glory it means that after it's all completed we are completed a completed work God is going to get the glory for it. We are going to, for eternity, be a glory to the Father. All that look upon us will glorify God. Because this will be the result of something that no mind in eternity could begin to comprehend conjure up <clears throat> when they see the final product the finished product they're going to look at the father in a totally new way than they've had for eternity to the praise of his glory so we're we're his workmanship we're being completed as we yield to the experiences that we have it's cementing a relationship it's preparing us for an eternal relationship eternal experiences that the Father already has waiting for us it's a win-win situation now notice what it says turn to 1st John 3rd chapter verses 1 to 3 behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. The world is totally ignorant of what's going on. And not, don't have a clue as to what's taking place here. <laughs> Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be for a work in progress. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We'll be finished products. And every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. In other words, it's saying in verse 3 that every man that understands spiritually what the Father is doing makes himself ready. Makes himself a yielded vessel to the Father knowing the Father has a best interest in heart and mind and knowing that what he's doing is going to glorify us and him in the ultimate finishing of it. Turn to Revelation, the 19th chapter. We were saying that everybody has a relationship with the Father in heaven sings the testimony, sings a, sings a new song. That song reflects that group's relationship shared 
set of experiences that makes them unique. The bride is not pictured as singing a testimony. The bride is pictured as having everybody else sing her testimony. So we're going to read verse <clears throat> Revelation 19, verses 5 to 8. And the voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him both small and great. Revelation 19, verse 5 to 8. We're in verse 6. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. We're going to see this, this ultimate group this elite group which everybody knows is the bride. And everybody else is singing her testimony. Can I ask you a question because I, I don't know if I heard you right. And mine may read different. And uh, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen, this is the part of the question, is the righteous acts of the saints. It just reads a little different, but... It might says righteousness of the saints. Oh, it did, it did. Okay, that's all right. Well, I was thinking it's God's righteousness, that uh, Jesus' is righteousness. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. When it says righteous acts, it gives the impression it's, that it's something that she did. But righteousness connotes that it's the position in Christ Yes. that is responsible not yes. something that's done yes anyway so what we find here is everybody knows all the other groups know the testimony of the bride none of the other groups can participate in that uniqueness when it says righteousness of saints these are saints so it's not in, in one individual it is a group of saints that are in this unique position and the bride's testimony is known to everybody she doesn't have to give a testimony it's already known just like the groom everybody else is testifying about the groom he doesn't have to testify for himself this is the uniqueness now notice what it goes on to say in uh, verse 9 and he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. He saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. So everybody else is called to the supper, which is a tremendous blessing. They had to die to get there. But the bride is called to union with the bride. This is the capstone of what the Father has been doing. Not only is he getting glorified, the son's getting glorified, the bride's getting glorified. Those that submit to what God is doing on earth today, just to the relationship that he's called us to, but basically all he's asking, and in everything else, just flows. Doesn't mean it's easy, because you got an enemy out there that wants to put a stop to it any way he can. But, those that commit, those that are willing to pay the price, this is what's waiting for. Okay, now you have the bride and the guest at the wedding supper. And the guest and the wedding supper, aren't they, um, let's say, born-again Christians, also got there the same way? They're the ones that, that made it through martyrdom. These okay. are the groups okay. that you see pictured, the ones on the, on the sea of glass, yeah. the ones before the throne. These are the ones that are giving testimony about the bride. 
Uh, they were all called, yeah. but they missed, missed, missed that one. Yeah.